Mars. Our understanding of the planet continues to evolve. From speculation. Are these really canals on Mars? To scientific advancement. If Mars does have life, it will be a life very different from the sort we have here. Each step makes the planet appear more Earth-like, a familiar place that exists in our minds beyond just fiction. There is something about making Mars into a map that changes our expectation of what Mars is and ought to be. This is Dr. Lisa Masseri, author of Placing Outer Space. Of all the ways I talk about placemaking, map making is the most obvious. And the reason it's powerful is because it takes the unknown and it structures and quantifies it. And as we dive into the unknown, charting Earth-like planets outside our solar system, there's always a pull back to the rock next door. It has to be something other than its sheer scientific value. It's a human reason, it's cultural, why we care so much about Mars. Aristotle studied Mars, and around the same time, Chinese astronomers referred to it as fire star. By the early 17th century, Mars was seen for the first time by telescope. But fast forward just a little more. The really interesting thing about the late 19th century was the year 1877. Dr. Maria Lane is the author of The Geographies of Mars. There had been a lot of advances in telescopic technology. So there were astronomers who did some really significantly detailed maps. They were able to put enough detail on the map that it started to look like a place. Two maps really sparked the public's interest. One from Nathaniel Green, and the other from Giovanni Schiaparelli. So for Green... He went taking these detailed sketches. At the same time, Schiaparelli made a map, but it looked completely different. Green's map had a lot of shading. Schiaparelli's map was like, line here, line here, this is white, this is black. Even if some of those lines came from, let's say, artistic liberties. These two maps went out into the world. People had to decide which one was more credible. So Schiaparelli was able to win that because he was able to claim that he saw more. That's what maps do. They show us what's out there. But more lines doesn't necessarily mean more accurate. And the initial description got a bit lost in translation. Schiaparelli's writing in Italian, he refers to these linear water features as canali. This gets translated in English into canal, although some people at the time said, no, no, he meant channel. And the reason this ends up being really important, channel was kind of interpreted as a natural feature. Canal was interpreted as a man-made feature. So Schiaparelli's map raises the question of, wait a minute, are there really intelligent beings? The question of intelligent life on Mars interested many people, some so much that they jumped into the hunt for it themselves. Meet Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell came from an elite family, basically decided I'm not going into the family business. Here's a man of means. He's like, I'm going to build an observatory. He became notorious for how many canals he added to the maps and pushed this idea that we were absolutely seeing intelligent life. Several astronomers questioned Lowell's theories. What? Leading him to explore a reason for the canals. All these lines on Mars were a global network that was meant to bring water from the polar ice caps, which were the only places on Mars that had water, to the arid regions. And he would go pretty far into explaining how this could be happening, all of which pointed to intelligent siblings on Mars. Who, who are you? We're from Mars. There's no intelligent life on Mars. And since the growing number of astronomers questioned Lowell's theories, Stupid question. He knew he needed to find proof. Hey, wait a minute! Hold everything, will you? Lowell himself initiates the beginning of the end. He directed his focus towards a new technology. Photographs, the authoritative visual technology that had emerged. The photographs did not show the network. They actually showed something like Nathaniel Green's 1877 map. Lowell's theories didn't quite pan out. 
But that's not to say they weren't influential. Three years following Lowell's first book about Mars, The War of the Worlds was released. The novel is one of the most influential pieces in science fiction, generating feature film, television, and radio adaptations. One specifically, has an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. Orson Welles' 1938 radio broadcast allegedly caused panic amongst some listeners, unaware it was all an act. Well, I think I've ever witnessed. A lot of fiction came out of these ideas of intelligent beings on Mars. What would it be like if we encountered them, if they came here, if we went there? Eventually, we did go there. Or I mean, we sent these things there. Mariner 9, orbited Mars for almost a year, transmitting more than 7,000 photographs to Earth. The Mariner program didn't see a large network of canals or advanced Martian civilizations. Instead, they saw features much more similar to Earth. This was a bevy of excitement for the scientists and mappers because then they saw these huge mountains, these valleys, these kind of rocks and ripples on the surface. Mariner 9 alone photographed 80% of the surface, giving astronomers the ability to thoroughly map these impressive yet familiar features. It allowed Mars to get transformed from this globe into a landscape, into the kind of place that we think about it today. Long after the first canal-filled maps were drawn and successful missions sent back real photos for all to see, we're still making new discoveries. And with these discoveries, our imaginations have shifted toward envisioning Mars as the next frontier, a place to build a civilization. Wherever this next chapter leads, we'll continue to explore Mars by using our connection to Earth as the ultimate guide.